tell them your excuses. But you know, this is like my actual first official week where I'm forbidding myself from researching crime and just doing anything research related. So, hey! Luckily, I have a shit ton, like I have a shit ton of extra research because I'm a fucking psycho who can't fucking stop researching every single goddamn day of this year. This is exactly why I'm having a break. So, luckily, Patreon came through and it has shit ton of episodes that I just not released to the public. Hey, maybe, you know, go patreon.com forward slash that pod to get this extra content and the new early releases but yeah because you're not here to hear me sing you're here to get that extra episode to normalize it and make it feel like i didn't just abandon you you're my child you're still my child there's me oh okay <laughs> i cannot say it where is me in like a non-dramatic high-pitched voice Remember when we had a month of heists, you know, robberies, normal stroke, S- Stockholm Syndrome, all of that stuff, right, right. Well, during that month, I've done like extra bits and pieces on Patreon again on robberies. And this case just fucked with my brain. Because I was like, okay, I can sort of clearly say like, okay, no, that person is going through Stockholm Syndrome. That person isn't, right? Because I'm not qualified. That's why I can just immediately tell straight from the get-go. But in the case of Betty Hurst, I was like, this bitch, I can't, I, I don't get it. You let me know what you think. Also, if you want to get like in depth, there's a podcast. It's called Patty Has a Gun. So if you don't get in depth after this episode, you know, if this has piqued your interest and you're like, whoa, Patty, you are fucked up. There's a pod for you that goes into like multiple episodes of just every part of Patty's life. But yes, I will still be checking my DMs. So if you want to slide into them and just let me know what you think. And just let me know, was Patty looking for a way out? Was she a willing participant? Or was she just brainwashed in a lot shorter time than people have been through history? Maybe, maybe not. So go ahead and enjoy it's the case of Patty Hurst. Hello, patrons. I know that you are here because you have just listened to the most underwhelming story of normal store robbery, and you're just like, what the fuck? Um, can we just get another fix on Stockholm Syndrome? Hey, I heard you. I heard myself in my mind, and then I made this, okay? It's the story of Patty Hurst. Yes, this is not the intro. No, no, no. I gotta set the scene. So, we're in 1970s, just a few months after the normal store robbery. So Stockholm Syndrome is just still pretty new. What's not new, definitely, is the amount of cults that have been roaming around. People already knew about Manson. But then the US it was in like a pretty shitty state because of Jim Jones, because of Watergate scandal, political bombings. And the most importantly for this story, the formation of Symbionese Liberation Army or SLA. So there was this guy, Willie Wolf, who was the son of the anesthesi- wait? The son of anesthesiologist. Is that how you pronounce it? Fuck it. He went to Berkeley to study anthropology. Why am I telling you about this guy? Well, because he is basically following the one of the biggest fears of mine, which is just like visiting prisons and then ending up like really involved into a um, prisoner's life and really not having the life of their own because you get obsessed. So he, while visiting prison inmates for a class, he starts calling himself Kujo, which again doesn't make any sense. Why give yourself a nickname for this particular task? He met a radical black bank robber named Donald DeFries, who would soon become the leading of the SLA. So DeFries escapes from prison. The way he escaped is he just walked away from his work details and from like his shore of the day, went into a safe house, and then was like, yeah, this SLA needs to come about. So guess what? I'm going to design the seven-headed cobra symbol. You know, every business has to have a logo, right? And then again, as a normal person, you need to have a mission of a company. This is why every fucking startup and every fucking company reminds me of a cult. Because this guy basically just wrote manifestos and designed a logo and that's it. You're set. You literally, that's every fucking startup's website right now. And then you just bullshit through a mission. <laughs> Can you tell? Can you tell how excited I am about the office jobs? So you're like, okay, great, this guy seems like he has a mission. What the fuck is it? What are these manifestos all about? 
Well, it's pretty simple. As their mission statement says, death to the fascist insect that preys upon the life of the people. That's pretty much it. No, like, supporting documents, you know, studies. Mm -mm. But, of course, when you have a mission, you quite approve it. So if you're a company, you know, you get your investment, to start selling product, and you're like, mm, you're showing your sales. No, what this guy does is kill a person. And this might be, so far, the worst fucking excuse and the worst just, like, manifesto and ideology about killing a person that I've read, but yep, it happens. It is a famous one. So it's the killing of Marcus Foster by the SLA. He was the Oakland's first black school superintendent, and they killed him for his fascist support of making school children in the district carry ID cards. I mean, that's pretty retarded, but they apparently didn't even know that this guy opposed the ID card plan. So they shot him eight times, which kind of like is making a statement in itself. It's like, yep, don't mess with us. They had apparently a particular 45 caliber bullet that they would also fill up with cyanide beforehand, which again is kind of more of a signature than it actually doing like more damage as a bullet. So apparently this for him is showing that they're serious about their left-wing struggles, like feminist, anti-racist, anti-capitalist, and that the Freeze wanted all races, genders and ages to fight together in the left-wing united front and to live together peacefully. Peacefully, my ass. Like, if you are this drastically opposing, peacefully is letting everybody choose whichever, like, political party, whichever ideology they want to follow. So, of course, is as in every story, this doesn't stop there. They're like, okay, we made our point now. Now we need to do something else quickly to make yet another point. Otherwise, as you know, you're not in the media, you're technically nobody. Everybody's like, oh, cool, like, so they just are quiet now, it's chill. So by the end of 1973, with the Foster killing still in the papers, the SLA decided to grab headlines by kidnapping Patty Hearst, famed Harris to the fortune of publishing magnate William Randolph Hearst from her apartment. It will be the actions of Patty Hearst during 18 months of being part of the SLA that still make you question the validity of Stockholm Syndrome 47 years later. We've got our crime, we got our perp. What was the motive? We are speeding up to the trial of Patricia Hearst just because it's important to understand a couple of things, including like the life after the trial and who well she is now. Just in terms of deciding on the motive and kind of thinking again about Stockholm Syndrome and what it does to a person. So she's at the trial facing charges of armed bank robbery and use of firearm in the commission of a felony in the Hibernia Bank case. Her defense team, as represented by F. Lee Bailey, who is, by the way, the guy that represented OJ as well, so it's like a really famous guy, probably like, you know, swimming in that dirty money. <laughs> and the defense is brainwashing and fear that she would be killed if she did not participate. Also, when she's asked what her occupation is, her response was urban guerrilla. Well, you know, kind of like doesn't do yourself justice if you still identify with your captors, but you are... <sighs> Just, I guess it is because, like, you're claiming brainwashing, so you're still, like, playing that part, or you're actually being brainwashed, whichever you agree with. But the judge was not sympathetic, because she was, well, she was with the SLA for about 18 months, but also, it was just about six weeks before she started releasing audio recordings for her family, which we'll go um, into later, but it's just, like, telling her family she is part of the SLA, brainwashing is bullshit, like, she's really into it. So the jury took everything into consideration and they found her guilty on both counts. And she was sentenced to serve seven years in prison. But she'd only been behind the bars for two years when President Jimmy Carter commuted her sentence in 1979. And it's kind of important to know that while she was enjoying her presidential pardon, all of the other remaining members of the SLA went to prison. So everybody apart from Emily Harris, who was the actual, the one holding a shotgun, got seven years, Emily got 13. Well, she got 13 added to the 20 to life sentence, which she already was facing for trying to plant bombs under police cars in the 1970s. 1970s were so fucked up in the US. I just don't even understand. It's just like one tragedy after the next. It must have been like a really fucking rough time to be living there. Just like, give me a break. There's so many serial killers lurking around now. There's like some SLA, which we don't even get the manifesto. We don't get what the fuck they're doing. 
They're just kidnapping people. Left, right and center. <sighs> also just imagine being a news company. Man, that would be mental if like internet existed. All of the news, like people would be fighting and paying up some crazy money for the headlines. What I find really telling in this case though is what Patty Hearst did after the trial in the first couple of years of freedom. She went to become an actress and not just any actress but there was one movie where she played the mother of a terrorist who helped kidnap a movie star. I think it's called Demented and it came out in year 2000. Uh, I think yeah I know that right. Well anyways but like wouldn't that be triggering? Okay, again, psychologists out there. Wouldn't that in itself be triggering enough for you to be like, yep, I can't actually go through with this? Like, was I technically lived through this situation? If you were actually, you know, brainwashed and under all that pressure and weren't actually part of it? Listen, with this case, like, well, I'll tell you my opinions later, but I'm just, like, not fully on board when it comes to Stockholm Syndrome and, like, really short periods of time, the way that it happened in the robbery, covering the main episode and here. Like, if it was, like, the case of Colleen Stan, right, the girl in the box, I get it. Like, somebody actually sold you, like, a proper fucking story. Kept you blindfolded. They're the only person that, like, you kept in touch with. You know, they kept you completely under control. And then they sold you, like, a story about slavery. They showed you, like, headlines and stuff like that. Like, there I can be like, okay, I get why you're not running. But here... Well, anyways, let's go directly to the kidnapping of Patty Hearst. So, February the 4th, 1974, we are at her apartment, right? She's there with her fiancé. When they just, like, open up the door, because, like, there was a knock at the door, they open up the door, and they drag her screaming at gunpoint from her apartment and just throw her into a truck of the car and drive off. Her boyfriend just ran and went straight to the police. Now, I know that this is the good part of the story, like, he went to the police, but hey, girls... If the guy runs, he, he ain't the one. Like, he, if he's there not, like, literally trying, taking the bullet, trying to save your life and being dragged from your apartment, like, um, yeah, maybe once you're done with all of that hostage situation, like, dump the guy. No, they were actually stopped by a cop, but, like, they were lucky, so the cop actually just stopped them because the lights weren't on. Some dumb shit, like, cops, please, always check the trunk. And... Immediately it became clear that SLA wasn't into her as a person, but like it was into her family affluence. There was no ransom demand. They actually were like, nope, we are keeping you with a blindfold, we are trying to brainwash you, and then we release you to record tapes for your family. And the tapes are trying to like request for her parents to feed the poor. So for her rich dad to pay $70 to every needy person in California in form of the groceries. Now first, I don't particularly get this. Like this is kind of like when the company's mission goes to shit. They just go AWOL and like start doing whatever the hell they want. You know, like every startup. But also I don't particularly get why the parents do what they do. Like I understand that you're kind of like, yep, well, I actually do have that money. So I'm not kind of doing exactly what they're saying, but I'm doing it like on an even bigger scale to convince them. But so her dad takes two million loan and gives the money to the group he founded, People in Need. But now this program somehow gets shut down and all of these needy people looted the giveaway operation in West Oakland and just start a riot. And then instead of everybody just being happy and fed, several people end up in the hospital. This is when the audio recordings they make Patty do kind of change. So the first two recordings that she did on days 9 and 13 of captivity were kind of the usual like, hey, I'm okay, but like just do what they ask you to do. But then after the riot and the suspension of the food giveaway, the tone shifted. So this is day 34. This is a quote from the recordings. Quote, Mom, Dad, I've been hearing reports about the food program. You said that it was out of your hands. What you should have said was that you wash your hands of it. It sounds like most of the food is low quality. No one received any beef or lamb. Anyway, it certainly didn't sound like the kind of food our family is used to eating. End quote. So again, still all of this time, either she is the one that's blindfolded or they are. So it's again so that she doesn't recognize the faces or so that they are brainwashing her as well. And apparently this works because she has been converted pretty quickly. So she was skinned up in February and in April is when she releases this audio recording. Quote, greetings to the people. This is Tanya. Out of the ashes I was reborn. I have been given the choice of one, being released in a safe area, or two, joining the forces with the Symbionese Liberation Army and fighting for my freedom and the freedom of oppressed people. 
I have chosen to stay and fight. I have been given the name Tanya after a comrade who fought alongside Che in Bolivia. It is in the spirit of Tanya that I say, Patria o muerte, venceremos. End quote. So again, a few things here. If you're thinking that this is scripted, which it probably is by them and that she's just reading it out loud, I think like I have been given the name Tanya doesn't necessarily work in their favor because it's not like it kind of sounds like it wasn't your choice in the first place. But also, how doubtful is that like she has actually been given the choice to like run or stay? I mean, if she has, girl, like always, if you're given the choice to run, run, fuck it. As I mentioned in that episode, like where Oprah interviewed like hostage situation experts and they were like, yep, you're not making the aggressor angry, like they're angry already, like it doesn't actually increase your chances of death if you resist it. So again, this statement is the most controversial one that I have found like or experienced just because like she is saying she has been given this, she has been given the name, she has been given the options and she hasn't taken them. Which I know is to enforce like the fact that she is one of them. But at the same time it really makes you think like did she actually choose to stay on her own accord. So this audio tape comes out with a photo of Hearst in revolutionary gear holding a submachine gun against the background of the SLA's logo of seven-headed cobra, which is the one which is one of the two most famous ones of her online. Now again, not to compare it with like the startups and the companies, but seriously, what these fuckers are doing? It's just trying to do everything quickly and dramatically and try to be like, yeah, no, 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 there was definitely a point to this, like this is part of our mission. Which again, if your mission is strong enough, then it should kind of showcase in your work, shouldn't it? Yep. So SLA moves like their base to San Francisco. And now they're kind of going around scouting for banks, because unlike any other robbers, they're not looking for banks that don't have security footage, like they don't have CCTVs, they're looking for the ones that do. And now you know how that statement was controversial? This whole robbery thing and like the footage we have of it is like even worse for me. So to show off the newest recruit, the SLA targets Herbernia Bank branch in San Francisco. And April 15th, 1974 is when the heist happens. They took about 10k because they were short on funds. But the bank's surveillance camera shows Patty Hearst holding a rifle. And this bank robbery actually results in two bystanders being shot. And now I get this is April. There has been, what, a span of two months? Two, three months. Still, this is the time when, like, you show that you are not brainwashed if you are. Like, this is the time when you either try to escape or, like, leave some sign. Like, look fearful on the cameras. Pass a note to the teller. Something. But no, she just, like, is there, ha- like, handling the rifle and just looks like she's part of the group. Every single witness that contributed to the statements, like, said that this was just a well-coordinated robbery. They didn't see her, like, acting anything else but in order with the rest of the army. And I think this was the preliminary moment when the public's opinion started to shift as well. So this was kind of like everything until then was like, oh my god, poor Patty. And this is when it's like, no, she might actually just be part of this. It's again like with the hostages in the Swedish robbery. And that thing where like police was witnessing it, they were like, they're acting like best mates. Has this been a part of it? Have they been in on it this whole time? Because it kind of like seems unbelievable to other people watching it and witnessing it. So SLA now has some money, so they move to LA. Now again, I don't quite understand why all of this was happening. Well, I understand why all this is happening so fast and everything is kind of like, yeah, every month we need to make a statement. But surely if there were like some CCTV cameras around, why didn't they tail the car? Like why did they allow it to happen for like such a long time? Because what happens next is just like, bam, bam, like it's like police trying to react, to these guys trying to act fast and it just doesn't end up well. So on May 16, 1974, there's a shootout at an LA sporting goods store. Because Bill Harris and his wife Emily were just like lurking around and I think like there's a statement that they tried shoplifting. So Patty, is, who is just chilling in the van, realizes her friends need her help because like the police is trying to detain them after they left the shop. So she just takes her rifle and fires about like 30 shots. Luckily, she doesn't wound anybody, but they make a getaway in a van. They would ditch a car, but apparently on the car, the police finally finds some piece of evidence, which is a parking ticket 
which had like their whereabouts so like they basically had like their safe house like, how is every freaking big case solved on a technicality also you would think like if somebody i mean i guess they need to check like whatever license or something but like you would think if you are part of like a criminal organization somebody stops you like you would give them the wrong address Ugh, i mean i guess like your car needs to be registered as well this is why don't have cars don't ever learn how to drive and don't commit crimes okay now the police is like yep we are gonna give you guys a shootout so may 17th they surround the house where the now no sla members are holed up and well apparently because they shot something or because of the amount of shots fired the whole building went up in flames and this was like broadcasted on live television so six of the sla members die in the shootout with the LA police in May 1974. But if you've been following this story that I started with the trial, Patty Hearst is not one of them. Because Patty Hearst decided to go to fucking Disneyland. So she and the Harrises were just watching this, like watching their freaking comrades go up in flames from Disneyland on live TV. About that, she said that our relationship foundation was our commitment to the struggle and our love for the people. Quote, I died in that fire on 54th Street, but out of the ashes I was reborn. I know what I have to do. Like, how many times are you reborn with, like, in this whole hostage experience? Like, why not stressed? Why not acting like a normal hostage would act? That's my whole thing during this fucking story. And apparently what she had to do was rob another bank in Sacramento. And now this is when again yet another innocent civilian, like a 42-year-old woman, was just going to church to deposit, like some money you know she believed in fucking god she was just shot in the chest by one of the sla members so this is again why in this whole story i'm just like well why any of this is happening because like at, at one point you're like no you're fighting for the people but then you're killing people technically for different reasons it's quite drastic and really not so strong on the mission kind of like elizabeth holmes of like this whole fucking situation where it's just like i can tell you like yep yeah, if, if you are <laughs> if you're basically dying but then um, the thing doesn't work but then you're like mm, it's fine okay you fuck it you died that's it you fighting for the hungry and then killing people going to church please allow it Finally, the authorities like follow a trail when one of the SLA members' brother tells the FBI that his brother is like sheltering her, and she's finally arrested at her flat in Mission District in San Francisco in September 1975, 17 months after the kidnapping. Now, let us go a bit into her childhood to understand yet again why this woman might have allowed herself to be brainwashed or or not. <laughs> Let's do this. Other than Betty Hearst, her family was actually the one that was famous. Her dad actually was like a publishing tycoon, that's how they describe him. Practically like he invented tabloid journalism. Which again, isn't it funny how everything comes around to bite you in the ass? In her autobiography that she named every secret thing, mm, mild, mild. On a scale of like great autobiography names, that's kind of like, do I want to buy it? Might not, my pass. She said that she was one of the, she was the middle of five daughters and she grew up in the affluent and sheltered environment, sublimely self-confident. Again, not helping yourself, Patty. What are you saying? (laughs) So her dad was the chairman of the Hearst Corporation, which exists today, right? As well, I know it, I know. And her mom was a University of California regent. Patty Hearst, who prefers to be called Patricia, literally nobody prefers, like, the fucking long name except for nickname, but hey, great, Patricia is such an exception. She attended a series of Catholic schools, earning A's and B's. Why do we always know the grades that these people learn? Like, I don't get it. Also, it's not like, oh, it's a brag, like, she was a straight A student, top of the class. It's like, oh no, she was A's and B's. What the fuck? Now, apparently, this is when she also was tutored by this guy, Stephen Weed in math, in high school, and eventually the two of them became lovers. So graduating from high school a year early, wow, so smart Patricia, you get it. She earned the reward for the best student, her forehead. She graduates top of the class and Weed receives a graduate fellowship and teaching grant and they both move to Berkeley. She's 19 and she becomes engaged to this dude with the plans like to marry the next year, so like 1974, like stop it. Why is nobody calm here? Why is everybody rushing in this story? I just had to Google his age. It's not alarming. He was 26, but boy, do whatever he was doing with his face did not work for this guy. 
the stash and everything. Like, there's pictures of them. He genuinely looks like he's 40-something at least. I was like, this is alarming. And then it actually says 26. Why the fuck did people in the, like, 70s look like 10 years, at least 10 years older than they were? The fuck? So now, what people have said about Betty Hearst? Well, all, all great things, as you can imagine. Apparently, while attending one of her Catholic schools, she actually lied to the nuns about her mother having cancer to get out of the exams. This is when you know it's like you, you need to chill, you need like something needs to calm down in you, because you can't be going around telling people you have cancer. Like, oh my god. According to the psychologist who later testified at her trial, she experimented sex drug from an early age. I mean, okay, not judging you, but everybody who kind of falls for, like, a teacher in high school, doesn't matter how old they are, doesn't matter if they're the same fucking age. Like, ever heard of grooming? If that guy actually goes for you, like, there's something wrong with that guy. I understand they might be hot or not, in this case, definitely not. But, man, you cannot do this. <laughs> And apparently there's witness accounts that she paid a visit to the same prison that the Freeze attended. Well, (laughs) attended. That he was in prison there. So now she never came clean about why the two of them would meet, how did this come about. But apparently her flat was also not so far from their current headquarters at the time of the kidnapping. So the SLA's headquarters as well. So it's just like, I think like this is kind of people trying to push it and be like, ooh, everything makes sense. But again, if like she was actually going to the prison to visit this guy, kind of raised his eyebrows. So that's a um, mini mini sewed on Patty Hearst's life. Now let's discuss the motives behind her crimes. Oh, obviously, the most commonly repeated thing that you can see online is that she has been brainwashed and. That, you know, it doesn't matter how long it takes. Yeah, you can brainwash a person in XYZ time. You know, she has been blindfolded. They were giving her these scripted things to read out to the family. But I don't necessarily believe in it. I do believe she was doing what she was doing to survive. In fact, I've put survival times two, the time when Maya does math. People just want to live. <laughs> what I mean by that is that, like, she saw the need. She was smart, right? She was smart, like, her family is affluent and well even though she would succumb to like dating a teacher etc like i genuinely think like she would see for something like this enough to be like okay no let's push it this is what i need to do to survive then after she saw like her whole like the army the whole family unit basically go up in flames she was like well now i kind of need to push this through to again well survive and act like i'm part of this but also to push like that brainwashing strategy because she she probably knew she's gonna get caught one day like people are gonna inevitably catch her alive or dead and then it's that bad when like well if at least they catch me alive i can play the brainwashing card and be like well they kidnapped me at least and i was a victim in all of this thing i was just reading off the scrape i was just doing whatever i was told to do to survive so i think like in her head i genuinely don't think that she was brainwashed for real I think, like, she played the brainwashing part really well to, well, to get the sentence reduced and get that presidential pardon because she realized that's one advantage that she had over anybody else in that group and that's one advantage that's gonna be her ticket out. That's the case. Let me know what you think, as always. You can post on Patreon. You can email me podbam at gmail.com. You can correspond to me now on Twitter and Instagram. I mean, I'm everywhere. And is Stockholm Syndrome in any shape or form clear to you? Nope, if anything, this case was like just consolidated to me like, yeah, this thing is not, I don't fully get it, I just don't. Because yet again, I just see it as a a survival instinct kicking in. And that's what I will keep seeing it as, especially in the case where it's like short-term kidnapping. In any other case, I'm like, okay, cool, I'm buying it, like, when circumstances are explained. But here, I'm like, no, you can't just go February to April. Cinderella to the stepmother, what is this transition? Like, I haven't achieved this much in in a fucking two to three months for this transition to be legit, okay? Mm Mm-hmm. Well, we part ways, okay? And let me know what maybe you think about Stockholm Syndrome and also what you want me to cover in June. I had to pause this for a minute to realize what next month in the year is. God, I'm so lost during this quarantine. Every other day of the week, I just wake up and I'm like, what, what is it? Mm. 
the day, what year, what am I doing with my life? Oh, same thing again. Oh, yeah, remember remember the times we had? Yeah. So you go into your next Zoom call and tell your boss not to pressure you to do anything because you don't want to end up like fucking Patty Hearst. Yeah, you tell them you're gonna fight to survive better than this. And leave normal audio notes to your parents. Ugh, millennials, you know? But most importantly, keep making the world a better place. One motive at a time. Bye, guys. You think the end is approaching? You think this is the end of the episode? Well, that is correct. That is truly correct. But it doesn't have to be the end of fun. Now I've got merch, everybody. I've got merch. And merch means merchandise. Which, as defined by Wikipedia, means support your motherfucking podcast. That's what it means. The links are in description. You know, link in bio. Whoa, peace sign. Cool hashtag on Instagram, you know. If you get it through Teespring, you can use the code PODBAM and get 25% off everything, anything, anything you see there. The tees, the stickers, the mugs, the hoodies. Get it, get it, get it now. And then if you use Redbubble, they don't do promo codes, but they do basically like a bundle. So if you get like, I don't know, six sets of stickers, whatever, you know, for the family, for the fam laptops, you know, stick them up. Get your family covered in merch. This is how we do it. And because this is kind of like still in beta version kind of thing, right? Right? Yeah, send any feedback, send anything that you want as a merch, any sayings or anything that's related to this podcast or just a world of spooky that you would want to wear and showcase to the public. And I'll be like, okay, cool, that's sick, that's sick, let's do that. And if you want to see how this merch actually looks on a person, just looks in general, well, I ordered obviously some samples for myself so you can check my socials. Well, the podcast socials that bam pod on twitter and instagram you know check how it actually looks like be like oh it looks nice you see we have the proof how it's gonna look like and then you order it for your chef and your fam yeah boy now i'm actually gonna exit this podcast you know but hey don't you just want me to do ads for anything yeah uh bye fuckers